one common denominator you find in the great heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11 is they all did something nobody had ever done before. And uh, I think that can be the greatest faith of all is being willing to press beyond the limits and just do something new and different. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, the Lord promising us abundant life. But, you know, he didn't say it would all be good. He just said be a lot of it. <laughs> Isn't that right? And, uh, you know, we just had a, uh, a meeting here on August the 8th, 08, uh, which is 8808, only comes around every thousand years. Uh, by the way, 8708 only comes around every thousand years, is 86, you know, but anyway, <laughs> uh, if you really think about it. But <clears throat> we uh, had quite a time, and, uh, you know, Bob Jones had prophesied the uh, birth of our daughter Amber and told us two years before she was born, that she would be born on August the 8th, and uh, she would weigh eight pounds, and uh, all that happened. She was born August the 8th, weighed eight pounds. He told us two years before, when we weren't planning on having any more children. Well, I really struggle with, what's he talking about? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're through there, and we weren't, and glad we weren't, but, uh, but you know, the... Uh, she was a sign of a new beginning. Eight is the number of new beginnings, and she was given to us as a sign. And, you know, this August the 8th, she became 18, which is really the time of maturity. And, uh, and I think she is a prophetic child. We watch her because she is a prophecy. And that's not an easy burden to carry for a young anybody. But... Uh, She's, she is special to us, and all of our kids are, of course, but, you know, I really appreciate the last three years anyway. She's wanted to be in Africa during the summer. Last summer, she spent her whole summer vacation. I mean, from one, one day after she got out of school until the day before she went back to school just about, she was in Africa working at an orphanage down in Mozambique. Rather than, she could have been laying out on the beach like all other teenagers, but her heart's in Africa with missions and and kids, and I, I just really appreciate that. I think there is a new breed rising up. By the way, when we started our meeting on 8808, the temperature was 88 degrees and the wind was blowing eight miles an hour. We can't make that happen. You know, we, 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 we get asked about one year, we've had, a lot, we've had a number of signs in the heavens in conferences and all, and one of them, we had a cross that appeared in the sky. We were doing a big outdoor meeting. It appeared in the sky, stayed up there for over an hour. I mean, it was a perfect cross. The moon moved behind it. I mean, it was, and I literally had people after that meeting come up to me and say, how did you guys do that? <laughs> you know, uh, stuff just happens, but I appreciate that kind of thing. But it really is a new day. We really are seeing something new begin. The church is going to be new. Now, when something's new, that doesn't necessarily mean it's better or good or, you know, it's just new, right? Uh, but there, the, the times are different. We're entering a, a new period. I believe the church is about to become very new. I believe there's uh, more than a renewal movement coming. I think there's a radical transformation coming. And we need it, but I appreciate what the church has been. You know, to me, it's not a negative towards what has been. I think the church has accomplished an incredible amount in being the salt and light of the, the world and, and all. And uh, I'm not, you know, I appreciate, I love the church as it is, but I know there is radical change coming, and it must come. It is time. It is time. There is a new beginning coming. And uh, I believe all of us can be a part of it. I believe, I don't care if you're in your 80s, I think you can be in the youth movement. You know, it's not about physical age. It's about your heart. It's about spirit. 
And uh, we really can become old wineskins very fast, incapable of receiving new wine. Too rigid, too inflexible. And, uh, and, and when that happens, you normally start getting uh, irritated at, at insignificant things. You start majoring on minors, getting offended at minor issues. Oh, I don't like that style of music. I don't like, uh, you know, whatever little things. That, that's a sign we're really becoming an old wineskin. I've seen brand new Christians become an old wineskin before they've been in the Lord a year. That thing can get on us. I've also believed that we have plenty who've been in the Lord a long time and are constantly open and fresh, expandable. You know, and I think that's the way we want to be. I think if we're not being stretched, something's wrong. And... Uh, if our first response to hearing something new or seeing someone new is, oh no, wait a minute, you know, fear, then I think we're already close to being a new, an old wineskin if we're not already, okay? Um, our, our first response to seeing something new and hearing something new should be expectation. It's got to be that, you know, if fear is controlling your life, then fear is your Lord. If fear of something different, something you're not familiar with, causes you to respond negatively, immediately, you know, throw up defenses when something new comes, we're in trouble. Now, we need to acknowledge that and, and let the Lord change us. I believe, you know, uh, when he talked about the new wineskins, I believe that word, and I've searched it out as much as I can, I think it could have been renewed wineskins. And there was, I, I found out, you may know, that there was a process for renewing old wineskins that had become too rigid and too inflexible for new wine. They dipped them in hot water, caused them to expand, and they dipped them in hot oil. And, uh, and they become like new wineskins again, flexible again. But I don't think the Lord wants to leave anybody behind. Okay? And even old wineskins are precious to Him. We need to consider that. He didn't want them lost either. He said, when He said He wasn't going to put the new wine in an old wineskin, it's because He did not want that old wineskin lost. So I think we need to acknowledge and honor even those who may have become Old wineskin, too rigid and inflexible for new wine, God still loves them. He still honors them, and we should, and, you know, there's a limit to what we should be uh, irritated by them, you know, or uh, as they may be irritated with us. And I'm, I don't know which side of that equation I'm on. I may be the old wineskin. I don't know. The, uh, you know, Lord knows. But... I do know that this is the time of new beginnings. And when he said, try all things, holding fast to that which is good, you know, there's a good skepticism and a bad skepticism. The good kind is really going to check you out. There's no doubt about that. They're not just going to accept everything. They're going to really check it out, and you better have the goods but they want to believe. The bad skepticism wants to doubt. They want, they, they try all things looking for the bad. That's contrary to scripture and I believe leads to deception. And we're deceived if we miss something God's doing. One of the, the most tragic uh, things that you see in the scripture is missing the time of your visitation. And that leads to a tragedy that's why the Lord wept over Jerusalem. They did not know the time of their visitation, and he saw what the result of that was going to be. We also have the example of the two men on the road to Emmaus, who here they have Christ joining them. Jesus himself joins their company and preaches what must have been the greatest sermon in all of history. Christ preaching Christ from the beginning of the scriptures to the end. And yet they could not recognize him because it says in the book of Mark, he appeared to them in a different form. 
And I believe the number one reason why we often miss the Lord when he tries to draw near to us is because he usually often comes to us in a form we're not used to and we reject him out of hand. These were disciples. If they had known him after the spirit, they would have recognized him right away. They only knew him after the externals. We can get so used to our charismatic form, our Pentecostal form, or our, our Baptist form, or our Catholic form, whatever, we cannot recognize him when God sent, comes as a Presbyterian. Or any other form we're not used to. Now, when we're so caught up in the form, it's because we're putting our trust in externals instead of the spirit. And, uh, and, you know, there's a lot that we could be said about that. But when, when their eyes were open, it's when they saw Jesus break the bread. And I think that too is when our eyes are open to recognize him is when he becomes the one who breaks our bread. When we're not just receiving from our favorite preacher or television evangelist or favorite author or anything else, but when it's not, it's not just hearing the words of the Lord, but hearing the word himself. And not just people, you know, and I, I believe one of the ways that we can get past that is to develop a secret relationship with the Lord. If your secret, private relationship with the Lord is not stronger than your corporate relationship, I believe things are out of order. There are things you want to do in secret. The Lord, let the Lord re reward you openly if he wants to, but there are many things we want to do in secret and we want to keep between us and the Lord. And I, I believe in taking most of our questions to the Lord secretly. I mean, I appreciate the hunger of people that are constantly coming and asking me questions, even though I have very few answers uh, for the questions I get asked. But the, uh, I appreciate that. But if you would take those questions to the Lord and let him answer them in that special way that only he can do, and you know you're getting it straight from heaven, you can ask him, and it may come out in the pastor's sermon on Sunday or in the next book you read or tape or could come on a billboard that has nothing to do with God, but you know that's God speaking to you and answering your question. That's something that comes from heaven and that's the rock that the church is built on. When he said, blessed are you, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven and upon this rock I will build my church, he wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about the rock that revelation straight from the Father is. That can never be stolen from you. If you get my opinion on something, that can easily, you can easily be persuaded by someone else's more brilliant opinion. But when you know you've gotten something from above, that's a rock. That's a rock. That's why we've got to, you know, when we see him as the one who breaks the bread. It's not just receiving words from the Lord, but hearing from the word himself. And that's our hope for, for you who have come to a meeting like this, that, that you don't just leave here having more words from the Lord or having a better prophetic sp perspective of the times, but you know his voice better. His sheep know his voice and they follow him because they know his voice. Okay. So, so that's the main thing. And that's why I appreciate teachings like you just heard from Steve that, that they, these stories help you to understand how he speaks, what he does. They're, they're teachings, they're lessons here. But get your own stories. You can't live off somebody else's story. And we don't live by bread that proceeded from the mouth of God. We live by bread that proceeds present tense from his mouth. There's a proceeding. You know, they had to gather that fresh manna every single day. And it's interesting to me that he tells them, go back and read it, it's in both Exodus and Deuteronomy. He said he gave them manna from heaven to test them to see if they would keep his ways or not. What? 
Well, how does going out and gathering manna determine if you're going to keep his ways? I believe it's the same thing for us today. I believe that is probably the main determining factor that is going to determine whether we keep his ways or not. Will we get up first thing every day to gather fresh manna from heaven? Well, that is the main devotion of our heart. What we want first and foremost, where we're going to get up and get something fresh from God every day for ourselves. And if you don't do that, if you do do that, you'll be amazed at how you'll be able to abide in Him all day long. And if you don't do that, your mind will drift. You'll waste most of your day in vain imaginations and everything else when you could have been getting closer to God, having fellowship with God, hearing from God. What would happen if all of our vain imaginations were turned into intercession? How different would we be, our families be, our lives be? But when you get up and get something fresh from God, first thing every day, you'll be amazed at how you'll start abiding in Him. And stuff will happen all day long. He wants to walk with us in our garden just like he did Adam. And it's true, he does live in us. It's better. But there is a fellowship we're supposed to be having with him every day where we're walking. Every day. It should be getting better every day. Okay? So all that was free. Now I'm going to give you some prophetic stuff. But that was more important. What should we do? I talked a little bit yesterday morning, and I'm I'm going to do this briefly. Matter of fact, I'm going to do it in 13 minutes. Okay? Just give you a little bit more of a prophetic perspective. But um, we're coming to times that I believe are the best of times and the worst of times. Doesn't that sound like a book? (laughs) But... We really are. And the worst of times are the best of times for those who are in the Lord. See that in Isaiah 60. Rise, shine, for your light has come. Glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples, but his glory will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. So the very times when the earth is going through darkness, the people going through darkness and even deep darkness, his glory is appearing upon his people. And I believe that's literal. That's literal, visible glory of the Lord. We're going to be seeing that more and more. His glory, he is going to enter his temple. He is coming into his temple. Okay. And uh, I think we're going to get so addicted to the glory of the Lord, we're going to be like a junkie looking for his next fix. If we don't get in the presence of the Lord, we're going to get to shakes before noon. <laughs> And uh, we're just going to have to have God. <laughs> but in general, we're in a, I believe, two to three year period of revival. And I believe that is the appropriate word because many Christians need reviving. They're somewhere between asleep and dead. And they really need revival. And it is grace from God. We need revival. And uh, there are all kinds of opinions and all about what revival is. I just want it. As I've studied them, everyone's different, unique. Uh, but we need, we need it when it comes, however the Lord wants to send it. The impact, I believe, I do not believe revival is for the purpose of reaching the lost. Okay, that's my personal opinion. I think it's wrong to take revival and try to steer it to reaching the lost. Lost will come to the Lord during revival, and it will result in that. But as I shared earlier, you know, as every poll or study we've done has indicated, only a tiny fraction of people come to the Lord through crusades, you know, uh, evangelistic campaigns, Christian television, everything else combined, it results in a tiny fraction percentage of people come to the Lord. By far, the overwhelming majority of people who come to Christ come to him through the witness of a friend or relative. So getting the church revived, the church will become the most powerful evangelistic force on the planet. We need to get the church revived, the church encouraged, 
And God, in doing all that he's doing now, the miracles he's doing, he's just moving in a dramatic way. The encouragement barometer has risen dramatically in just the last few months, almost across the spectrum of the body of Christ. I think it's going to still go up. Matter of fact, I don't believe the revival has yet been born, that we're in, still in the pre-revival contractions that are about to give birth to it. Okay? They're getting intense. You know, as you get close to the birth, the contractions get more intense and more frequent. And I believe they're getting intense, and I believe we're right near the birth now. I'm expecting the birth this fall. Uh, but, but I don't think we've really even seen the birth yet. And it's going to be spectacular. I believe for two to three years, it is really going to rise in intensity. Okay. But um, after that, I, I expect to change. And I expect things maybe not to move quite as fast, but they'll go much deeper and much further. I believe great new movements are about to be born that really give birth to great new advances and spiritual advances for the body of Christ. Extraordinary. I, I think many of those that we perceive in, as the leadership of the church today, that I think we've had some of the best in, in church history are alive today. I really believe that. Some of the greatest pastors, greatest missionaries, greatest... I mean, God has given us an extraordinary leadership. By the way, I mean, almost any time I hear the charismatic renewal mentioned, it's in negative terms. More people came to Jesus through the charismatic renewal than any other movement in history. More people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. More churches were planted. More movements begun. There was a greater advance for the kingdom of God by the charismatic renewal than I believe you could say happened in all previous advances our movements in the church age combined. Do you realize in the last 20 years more people have come to Christ than did in the, since the original day of Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago up until that 20 years? People don't realize the incredible moves of God that have taken place all over the earth are still moving. Now a lot of that has to do with the population of the earth today equals all those who have lived up until that time. Okay, but God is moving dramatic ways. Incredible things are happening. And I, I do believe, you know, there were some glaring mistakes made by the charismatic renewal and some flaky things happened. It's happened in every move of God. I mean, you, I don't believe you can go with that. Look at every single leader in the Bible except one, and they did stupid things. They embarrassed God. But you know, he knew they were going to do that before he called them. He loved them before, used them before, loved them after, and used them after. I mean, look at King David, a man after God's own heart. I mean, we haven't had to deal with murder yet from one of our leaders. Except for the biblical definition, there's been a lot of anger towards their brothers, you know. But do you understand what I'm saying? People are going to mess up. I mean, I'm still wrestling with, Lord, why didn't you just stay here and run things? I mean, think of those 12 apostles on that day, the day of Pentecost. All these brand new believers, thousands of new believers, they're looking at these guys, their leaders, and saying, aren't these the ones that just betrayed him? Denied him? Fled from him when he needed them the most? And they're our leaders? Think about Jesus. One guy gets it. He says, you're the Christ, the Son of... You're the Christ, the Son of God. One guy gets it. Gets the revelation. Jesus says, okay, you can deal with it now. I'm out of here. That's why Peter pulls him up. I said, no way, Lord. No, he's saying, you, you guys can handle it now. You've got the revelation. Or at least one of you. I'm thinking, you know, on the day... The Passover, the night before he's crucified, they're still fighting over who's the greatest. And he's totally content. They'll deal, they're they're going to be fine. They were not fine. We're not fine. Leaders, human leaders are not okay. We've got issues. we got problems. 
But you know what? The Lord's trust was not in those people. It was in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can fix anything. You know, when he moved over the earth in the beginning, it was chaos. It's one of the words there. It's chaos. He knows how to deal with chaos. He loves chaos. I think he enjoys it. Look at the incredible creation he brought out of this chaos. I don't care how much chaos your life is in right now. He could deal with that. I don't care how impossible the situation is. And listen, I'm getting bombarded with so many emails right now. You cannot believe the chaos. I'm saying, what an opportunity for the Holy Spirit. He loves this. He really loves this stuff. He is going to do an awesome job here. I don't know how. We have a saying around here. We may die of a lot of things, but boredom is not going to be one of them. But I do believe we're not wise if we keep putting our trust in people. They can't handle it. Everyone, everyone in Scripture and somehow disappointed, didn't they? Even the greatest leaders, the greatest heroes, except for one. He's the one we put our trust in. If you put your trust in him right, you can trust all other people. And if they disappoint you, it doesn't bother you that much. Hey, there, that's, hey, we'll do it next time. That's why he said in Galatians 6 1, if someone's caught in any trespass, anything, boy, if that doesn't stretch us. And boy, there's some any things that are going on these days. He says, you who are spiritual, if you're spiritual, you will restore them. And you'll do it in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you too be tempted. And the way the Lord put that to me is if you don't do this and you don't handle it with gentleness, you're going to fall to that same stuff. And uh, I'm not a very gentle type person. That's not my name. I really have to fight. I really need grace from God to be gentle. I mean, people have come to me wanted counseling from me for years. I tell you what my whole counsel is. I can give it to all of you right now. Get over it. Why are you bothering me? I got my own problems. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's, I am not a, I'm not a, you know, John Wimber used to tell me all the time, I'll never be a pastor. He said, you're not, you don't have that warm, fuzzy, touchy, feely thing. People are not going to like you. I said, I, you know, I don't really care. That's how untouchy and feely I am. I've really gotten to love people. And uh, I I really, you know, I don't know, always have. I'm just not that kind of soft, touchy-feely type. And uh, I don't like navel-gazing. I don't like introspection and stuff like that. Why keep digging up the old man trying to get him healed? Just bury the sucker. Kill him. Have you ever considered that the two most powerful beings in the universe are both trying to kill you? God and the devil. I think we're going to get killed. So why not just die? Get over it. And there's a lot we have to, you know, but if you're dead, you're the most free person on the planet. What can you do to a dead man? Dead men don't get offended. They don't get rejected. They don't have fears of failure. They don't have any fear. They're dead. What would happen if a people arose truly dead to this world? That's going to happen. Those who are dead to this world but alive to Christ. I am prophesying one thing to you. The cross is going to be popular again. The crucified life, the true crucified life. That's going to be a new thing to this generation. It really is. We preached it, taught it honored it and everything else. I don't think we've lived it too well. In general, some have. But I tell you, it's going to be popular again where we wake up every day not living for ourselves, but for Him. We do all things for the sake of the gospel, where the love of Christ controls us, not selfish ambition, not trying to build our own ministries and all these other trappings where we really do all things out of our love for Him and how He deserves the reward of His sacrifice, His cross that's coming. You read it. You know, I love reading the classics. 
That's why I love stuff like this, you know, reading the stories and all, but sown throughout the great men and women of God throughout history, the ones who really accomplished and I believe had, believe had lasting fruit, they lived the life of the cross. It's sown throughout their teachings. You can tell in the testimonies about them, it was their lifestyle. They didn't live for themselves. They lived for him. It's going to be, it's going to happen again. The cross will be popular again. Now, we don't want to stay there. It leads to resurrection. That's true. You know, uh, but you, you know, uh, no one can be resurrected if they don't first die. That's the very definition of resurrection. If we want to walk in the resurrection power of the Lord, we've got to learn to die better and die daily and die daily. No greater power will ever be released than through Christians who take up their crosses. You want to see the power of God in your daily life? Take up your cross daily. We have an unbelievable open door before us right now. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it and give you some more details of things I've seen in all as far as that. But I tell you, this I am prophesying. The church is going to go to the cross again. And if you see this, you know, the church entered a baptism, the Red Sea baptism, leaving Egypt. They entered the Jordan River baptism, which was the same thing, the cross. Jordan River speaks of death. That's why Jesus baptized there and John baptized there and it empties into the Dead Sea. They had to cross that river when it was overflowing all of its banks. It says all of the days of the harvest, which the harvest is the end of the age. And you see when those priests stepped into it, it says in the river, the waters of the Jordan were rolled back all the way to Adam. Read it in Joshua. No accident that place was called Adam. We're going to see death rolled back when we're willing to enter in and take up our crosses again. As we've been called to do is true discipleship. Those who seek to save their life will, leave, will lose it, but those who will lose their life for his sake will find it. The cross will be our banner again. Truly, so appreciate you know, that song Molly sang this morning, that uh, <laughs> the power in the blood. We really are going to get the grip on some of the most important fundamentals. And you know, the most successful people in any field, anything, sports, business, preacher, any, they're those who do the basics best and never forget the basics. There's something returning, but I tell you, unprecedented power is going to be released. We're going to see unprecedented miracles. We haven't seen them yet. We've seen them unprecedented for us. But it's going way beyond that. I was shown literal mountains being plucked up and cast into the sea by people's commands. Literal mountains. That this will be done. The Lord said it had to be done to prove that his word is true. We're going to see the most remarkable things. But I believe it's going to come through a people who are not wanting any of the credit. They don't care about that. They want to see the Lord glorified. They want to see his will done. These are unprecedented times, unprecedented potential and possibilities right now for anyone who is here. Anyone. Doesn't matter how young, old, male, female, doesn't matter. What do we have better to do?